Today I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about SEO. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk to you about mistakes <laughs> that we see uh, all the time. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm going to dive into um, uh, what those are, how to fix them, and talk about best practices today as well. So, all right. Uh, so yep, I'm going to do a brief intro, um, talk about me, my role at Imagine, my team here, uh, and I'm also going to talk about best practices, mistakes, and, quick, and fixes, and I want to leave a lot of time for Q&A um, so that you guys can ask any SEO-related questions that you might have or any coding-related questions that I can help with, um, and I can hopefully give you some answers that are helpful. All right, so um, this is kind of taken from our standard sales presentation, but I tweaked it a little bit. Uh, I am... Um, uh, the VP of Digital Marketing Services here, so I lead an amazing digital marketing team. Uh, all of their pictures are up on the screen below. They are sitting right there. Shout out to my digital marketers. Um, we have some very, very happy clients. We have a lot of referrals. We are very, very busy uh, and always have a lot of clients uh, looking to, to work with us. Uh, we primarily operate in B2B, uh, but because we uh, do digital marketing, we are 100% tied to Imagine. We do digital marketing for non-Imagine sites all the time. We have some B2Cs, we have some B2Gs. Um, basically, if you need help with digital marketing, we're, we're here to help you with that. Uh, and that includes SEO, PPC, social, uh, conversion rate optimization, uh, you name it, we will give you our opinion about it. Um, we're very research vision, uh, driven, uh, everything we do is backed by numbers, highly analytical team, very big on reporting, um, and lots of top talent here. Um, so, I'm standing on the incorrect side of the presentation. Um, Hannah from my team, um, <laughs> uh, with uh, all of her talent, went ahead and put some memes that'll be helpful during our presentation today <laughs> because we're going to be talking about mistakes. Uh, these are all outtakes from uh, a past Team Imagine uh, video that we shot um, that will hopefully kind of get the message across when we go through all the mistakes. Oh, you're giving me a pointer? This guy. Yes. He's a I know, I was blocking the leaves. It's the whole point of the presentation. Ah, oh, you're right. He's the best. Um, so yeah, I'll take a few best practices and we'll dive into some issues. This is great. All right, so <laughs> even though we do everything, we're a full service digital marketing team here at Imagine. Um, I am a uh, born and bred SEO specialist uh, by my start. Um, so what we do in, in accordance with SEO best practices is very much white hat and very much by the book. Um, so this is a very abbreviated version um, of best practice, but basically it starts with keyword research. Um, and we want to put those keywords that we choose for a client in the places where Google looks for them to be able to optimize the website. Um, so we're going to optimize your on-site elements, we're going to optimize your off-site technical elements, and that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and then you end things up with, you know, seeing how you did, tracking progress, tweaking, refining the strategy, and, and making changes to, to better optimize the site continually. But, <laughs> as we optimize for our ongoing clients, and we have many, uh, we tend to catch a lot of mistakes um, that happen both during build and uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, a very popular one uh, is a mess up with H1s on a homepage. Um, sometimes we'll see too many, sometimes they'll be missing. Um, so it's always good to know that it is a best practice to only have one H1 on your homepage. Uh, and that H1 should be optimized and you can swing it. You should put a keyword in there um, because it has a lot of value to it. There's more value in the paragraph text um, and other uh, text elements like alt text or uh, internal linking or external linking that might be happening throughout your content on the page. Um, so it's very, very important to only have uh, one H1 uh, and no more than that. Um, this can come, become an issue on a homepage, especially if you are watching both panels. Um, you're going to have uh, multiple headlines of the same size uh, for different panels on a page. Um, so you may want to do some uh, CSS tweaking to make sure that they all look the same. Uh, but the one on the main panel uh, is your only H1. Um, so this is a very common one. Uh, a lot of developers uh, just really, you know, want to get a site live and up and pretty uh, and to spec as the designer designed it. Uh, and they may not think about sustainable development when they're developing. Uh, and one of the key issues that we often run into is that a site may not have been developed with tracking in mind. Um, the marketers that we deal with, that we work with on a daily basis, uh, 
their jobs, a lot of their jobs are dependent on the performance of the website that they manage. So we need to make sure that we can track that website appropriately and let them know what's working, what's not working, and what to tweak to be able to make things work better. Um, so if you are designing anything clickable, that thing is trackable. So you want to make sure that you're designing that thing um, with the necessary items to make sure that it can be tracked. Um, a very hot uh, tracking mechanism that we're using a lot here lately is called Google Tag Manager. With Google Tag Manager, if you guys have any familiarity with it, uh, to be able to fire tags or tracking mechanisms, those things need to fire off pieces of code, CSS selectors or classes. So when you are developing, um, if you're thinking for a, about a long-term development, about something that's sustainable, it's very important that you add those elements because if an SEO firm or a digital marketing firm comes in after the fact, uh, they're going to have to do a lot of rework on your code to be able to make sure that they can track uh, what's working uh, and what's not. Another thing to keep in mind that we see a lot um, are thank you pages that um, do not have unique URLs after a form has been completed. Uh, they may signal a page refresh. Um, they may be linked to a form in a light box. Um, and if they don't have a unique URL, nine times out of 10, uh, we can track them. We can track a submit button with on -click tracking. Um, but the preference uh, to be able to see you know, how people came to the conclusion that they wanted uh, to fill out a form is really through a goal completion in Google Analytics. And we can only do that with a unique thank you page URL. Um, so the takeaway here really is to avoid light boxes <laughs> wherever you can. Um, give your forms uh, unique URLs, uh, and give your landing pages unique URLs so that they can be tracked. Ah, so this became um, very popular <laughs> after Mobilegeddon happened uh, last year. Um, site speed has always been, um, well, not always, but recently, has, has been a ranking factor for SEO. A site needs to load quickly. Uh, it needs to be optimized so that um, you know, user experience is strong, and it is an SEO factor. Um, it's also an SEO factor that those images um, are responsive for mobile usage and they can load uh, quickly on a mobile device as well. So um, with this in mind, it's really important that when you are launching a new site that you're making sure that your images are compressed uh, as well as they can be. Um, JPEG is usually the file type of choice because it is the highest quality uh, along with ease of compression. Um, so we highly recommend going that route. There are a lot of uh, sites that we work with that we need to um, go back through and press images, resave them, re-upload them. Uh, and when we do do that, um, we really like to go the extra step by utilizing keywords in file names, not just uh, launching an image with numbers uh, in the file name or something that is relatively generic. Uh, it's a place that Google crawls. We want to add uh, keywords there, uh, as well as adding alt text within um, our, our linking tags. So something to keep in mind. Um, so a lot of uh, developers, um, when they launch a new site, want to implement the, uh, the top-level wildcard. It's really not a best practice when it comes to SEO. We do one-to-one, three-to-one redirects. Uh, and the reason that we do that is to maintain SEO value from one URL to a new URL on a new site with appropriate content that is taking the place of the old content um, that is going. So if you're thinking about a wildcard, I'd say skip it and uh, make the client fill out the spreadsheet <laughs> and have them upload that spreadsheet. Um, or send it back to you to upload um, through a plugin like the redirection plugin. Uh, we also recommend uh, that you ensure that the top level 301, uh, when you launch a new site, is done correctly. Um, if you don't do it correctly, it can result in canonicalization issues, um, basically the site appearing both at both the www and the non www version of the website, signaling site-wide duplicate content issues. Um, so uh, making sure that you do the top level 301s and one-to-one -one 301s is completely essential when you're launching a new site. So this can happen inadvertently uh, with plugins uh, like WordFence that might be used to secure your site. Um, you can block Google, but you may not need to. Uh, and chances are, if you are um, one of those agencies that is a one and done, you're launching a site and pushing it out, you're not really going back in to check uh, what's been blocked and, and what hasn't. Um, so when new sites get killed by crawlers at launch, New crawler sniffs out new content, they want to attack all of it uh, and eat it up all at one time. Um, often, certain, certain IPs can be locked uh, to be able to ensure that a site isn't taken down. Um, you want to make sure that those, uh, those IPs that are blocked do not have anything to do with Google so that Google can correctly crawl and index your entire site. 
Um, you also want to make sure, and this may seem like a no-brainer, but if you guys are under the gun and you're launching things quickly, you may forget about some of those no-index or follow tags. Um, they appear more often than you might realize on sites post-launch. Uh, you want to make sure to get rid of those except for the places where they are appropriate, like thank you pages or like landing pages that are used for paid search. Um, so just making sure that, you know, the, the crawler that you want to access and index your site can get to it is a great best practice and will bring you guys continual business if you're, uh, you're building sites through WordPress. <coughs> it's a very common one as well. So if tracking code is added incorrectly, it messes with our stats. Um, I still have one client right now whose time on site is second in their Google Analytics account. It's because their remarketing tag is placed um, above their Google Analytics code in the, the back end of the website. And we are waiting for their maintenance firm to make that switch for about three weeks now. Um, but it's been, it's, it's been tough for me to report accurately on you know, time on site, time on page, what's working and what's not, because the data is inaccurate. So before you implement code, especially something foreign, because this code is probably familiar to a lot of you guys, where it goes um, you know, at the beginning of the body, at the end of the body, it's probably very familiar to most of you. Um, but if it's something foreign, like um, AdRoll or HubSpot code or some sort of marketing, uh, marketing automation uh, snippet, like something tied to Marketo, it's very important that you guys at least, you know, check in and Google to make sure that you're putting it in the right spot. Uh, it may seem like a very simple thing, but it can save, you know, a world of hurt <laughs> when it comes to tracking the effectiveness of, of your website. So before you enter tracking, please um, double check that it's done correctly um, or your stats will be messed up. All right, so uh, a lot of developers skip the robots.txt. We highly recommend it. Um, it's a best practice, even if you don't put much in there. Um, what it's really used for, and I'm, I'm sure most of you guys know this, is to tell Google where not to crawl. Um, but Google looks at it anyway when it's going through and crawling your website. It's a top level element, and it's one of those things that Google checks out. Um, so if you don't have one, we recommend adding one, even if you just have your sitemap.xml file in there. Um, but we also recommend um, being sure that if you choose to block things in there, you're blocking the right things. There are a lot of sites that we work with that um, block uh, CSS and JavaScript. Um, that is um, pretty often due to load time, I'd say. Uh, but what happened after the mobile getting algorithm update launched last year is that um, Google needs to see that to ensure that you have mobile CSS and everything is launching uh, correctly on the mobile site. Since it is a ranking factor, uh, it's very important that that's done. Um, so when, you, when it comes to a robots.txt file, I default to let them in. <laughs> and then, uh, unless you have something that's highly secure, like a customer section um, that is password protected, that you really already have the no index, no follow tags on, but you want to be sure that Google has the directive um, not to access it. Um, if, if it's something other than that, I, I would tend to default towards allowing uh, Google access so it can crawl and render correctly. Another missing, missing one that's popular is a sitemap.xml file. So you launch a new site, Google's going to find it. It's going to crawl it. Um, but it may not crawl in its entirety. It may not crawl correctly. And it may not come back and revisit it as often as you'd like. So we recommend that you add a sitemap.xml file. If you guys are Yoast users, you have it automatically, the sitemap underscore index. Um, but Google, that is the only way that Google really sees everything and can crawl everything um, once the site is launched. Uh, and the way to really ensure that Google is, is doing that is to upload your sitemap.xml file through Google Search Console. I still mess up and say Google Webmaster Tools. I'm sure a lot of you guys do too. Um, but that is the only place, only place available to upload your sitemap to Google. Um, we also recommend when you create that file, if you do create it with, um, with a different tool and, and don't use Yoast, um, to make sure that you're setting crawl frequencies and crawl priorities. If you have an active site, you want to make sure that your site's recrawled re at least once a week. And you want to make sure that your home page uh, and your higher priority pages are crawled more frequently and have a higher priority in your sitemap.xml file. Uh, we see this sometimes too. Uh, an incorrect SSL certificate implementation can cause more duplicate content issues. It can cause Google to get confused over whether a site is secure or not secure. Um, so we um, want to make sure that you guys, when you're adding that uh, top level redirect to the HD access, that it's done correctly. It's added. It's done correctly, and you can't access the site without that HTTPS in front. All right. So um, a lot of people think that Ajax right out of the box, it can be crawled entirely. It's not always the case. Um, so if you guys are using Ajax, and gosh, I hope none of you are using Flash. 
Um, <laughs> if you're using either element, uh, you want to make sure that you're doing it in a way that Google can crawl it. Uh, and a great way to be able to check that, which our developers use frequently, is the fetch and render tool within Google Search Console. If you give Google a URL on a page that you're coding, and you're using Ajax on it, and you throw that URL into the fetch and render tool, you can actually see how Google is crawling that page, what it's seeing. Um, you may find with certain uh, Ajax instances that it's not seeing what you coded, and it may need to be recoded. Um, so take care when you're using those, um, those languages to, to make sure that everything that you're coding is, is actually being crawled and accessed. This happens too. Um, uh, when you allow landing pages and thank you pages to be indexed, uh, you are messing up the stats of whoever is running SEO or digital marketing for the website um, that you built. Uh, if you allow these pages to be indexed, they can be accessed organically. Um, and if they're be being used for paid search, it's very important that your paid search specialist who's ever running paid search for the site uh, can prove ROI on their paid search campaigns. It's far more important for paid search strategists than it is for SEOs. Uh, so you want to make sure that the traffic that is actually going to those landing page, pages is paid search traffic. Uh, and the way to do that is to make sure that nobody else can find those pages um, unless they're driven to them by a paid search advertisement. So to do that, you want to make sure that a no index, no follow tag is on those areas so that um, those running PPC can report accurately. And that's it. Okay. So thanks, guys. South Coast map, mass uh, web design, or come up for multiple towns rather than just the town in which your business is listed? Do you really need to create multiple simultaneous sites? So if you're trying to do local SEO, that's really the, the best way to go about it, okay. is to make separate pages that are optimized for keywords that are related to that geographic region. We always recommend that you don't do research before you do that optimization, so mm -hmm. use the Google Keyword Planner and all that good stuff. Um, what we don't recommend is hiding them. Okay. Um, so if they are added, we always recommend that they're accessible via the navigation. Having hidden optimized pages uh, is a little gray hat um, okay. because it's, it's an attempt to kind of fool the search engines. Okay. Um, so if you do add them, we recommend that you put them underneath, you know, a location or an about us overview and optimize them for each specific region. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, one more. Um, yes. Shoot. Is using a listing company worth it? Um, for example, we're using Yax to manage our listings across multiple businesses. Uh, have you found that's really effective or not? So we are a manual crew, uh, which creates a lot of work <laughs> for my group. Um, not a big fan of uh, listing uh, companies. Um, we feel that those listings require a bit more oversight and optimization to them. Uh, if you want to just have the listings to have them, a listing company is fine. But if you care about somebody typing in a query and finding your directory listing, uh, it's better off that somebody um, goes in, creates it manually, and, and optimizes it. And okay. also, uh, not all directories and listings are created equal. Um, there are some that it's kind of just a waste for you to be on, and a lot of those uh, automated services, uh, those are that's, that's one of their chief areas where they create those listings. Free ones that nobody checks, that do not pass, do follow links, that have no true SEO value. Um, so we recommend you know creating listings on um, strong directories that have uh, a decent amount of SEO authority and are actually going to bring some business to the website. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Question? I had a really quick question. Uh, when you say uh, keywords, Yes. there's the meta keywords uh, description that you know, they can use. Yes. I've, I've heard that that's not very helpful. Yes. So but you're, you're using keywords as in things that people would search for, let's say, in Google. They, attached that to a picture, an alt tag, or anything like that, so common search keywords that we can sure. search to? Yeah, so um, everybody here, if you're using the meta keywords tag, you can skip it. Uh, Google does not crawl it. It also assigns no SEO value to the meta description tag. 
So if you're writing that, you can skip keywords there too. <laughs> That's really just a place where you can implement a call to action that appears on a search engine results page and can differentiate you versus the nine other results on the page. Um, what you really want to focus on, uh, if you've done some research and you have some keywords that people are typing in and you're gunning for, are your title tags. You want to make sure that every page has an optimized title tag, that, that title tag length is around 60 characters or so, um, and that you have your most important keywords that are assigned to that page at the front of that title tag. Um, that's really going to give you the most bang for your buck. Uh, here we also weave keywords into alt text. We have them as anchor text um, for our internal and external links. Uh, we weave them throughout the content. They're in our headline tags. Um, they're everywhere. <laughs> everywhere that Google looks for them. But um, because we do so much manual optimization, uh, we skip what we know is not going to give us a lot of <coughs> value. And that should make you good. So. Any other questions, guys? Yes? Um, when it comes to SEO keywords, yes. um, have you found a way to uh, more accurately determine searchers' intent rather than just the keyword planner? Great question. Um, we, it is integral that we have strong relationships with our clients. Um, we talk to our clients all the time. The more the better. Um, typically, we talk to them at least once a week. So what we do is we have to use the planner. You probably know it's the best, best tool we have out there um, for search volume and competition. Uh, but every keyword that we choose, and you guys might think this is a little dangerous, uh, we run it by our clients. Yeah. Um, so they are the best barometer of what their prospect's intent is when they're searching. Um, their sales teams are even better than they are, because they're usually in marketing. <laughs> um, so uh, it's that collaborative um, kind of inherent knowledge of your prospect that creates the best keyword strategies. Um, so we loop everybody in that needs to be in, and then we make our choices. We give our input from an SEO perspective, um, but we take theirs in terms of relevance and intent. Um, so that collaborative type of relationship creates the best intent-based strategy. Uh, and the other good thing, too, is we talk to them so often. So when new trends are happening on the sales side and they get back to marketing, we hear about those really fast. So we're doing ad hoc keyword research for clients all the time. Um, based on new intent trends that are happening in the industry. Um, but if you find a new one, yeah. gosh, I'd love to know. Because <laughs> that is really where all this is going. It's definitely going to user intent. I got a question with the last slide. Too. Yeah. Um, if you mind rewinding. Of course. Uh, I had a question. You were talking about PPC uh, leading to those pages, making sure that you don't index them so they don't show up in like, a ranking on Google. Yep. Um, could you just re-explain that one more time? I thought I had a question about not PPC, but organic search instead. So if you're using content to lead to those pages, like, for sure. instance, you had a if you wrote a blog post about something, and then you link at the bottom of the post you have a call to action yep. for maybe an ebook or something that leads to a landing page. Yep. So what about uh, good good question? And I didn't make that distinction when I was on this slide. Um, so. Landing pages can be uh, created for all different kinds of uses. Um, this slide really was primarily for um, paid search, like for email campaigns, too. Um, but if you have an ebook um, that you want to market normally throughout your site, it's fine if you build a landing page that you want to be indexed by Google and organic, and that you link to internally, and you link through two of other campaigns. But if you're going to market that ebook through a paid advertising um, endeavor, you want to make sure that you're building a separate landing page, um, probably with less content, with a form higher up on the page uh, that uh, nobody else can see except those paid search searchers. But yeah, I didn't, I didn't differentiate. That's a great catch. Any other questions, guys? All right. Well, I hope that was helpful. Um, and if anything comes up after the talk, you know, I'll be mingling around. Um, but with that, I will uh, hand it off to Christian. Thanks for coming.